Welcome to Nonlinear Optics, last but one lecture. We will talk about propagation of pulses in nonlinear media. I hope that everybody had a good look at chapter 14, for which I provided the script. I have to say it took me some, some time to, to write all these uh, formulas up in, in LaTeX. Um, one announcement. Uh, just before we start, uh, it's on teaching evaluation. We, uh, here at uh, the University of Jena, well, rather at uh, the physics department, our student council runs a very effective system on teaching evaluation. And this uh, system has um, a very good impact on teaching quality. Um, here at the Faculty of Physics and Astronomy, we have by far the best teaching quality, um, at least at the University of Jena. This is no joke, actually. Yeah, so this is actually the truth. Um, and uh, I would like to encourage you to take part, to give feedback, positive and negative. Of course, I would hope that if you had suggestions for improvement that you would have told me this many weeks ago so that I could have considered it. Anyway, you will find, uh, so I sent you the uh, information and I also uh, have a link uh, on that on the Moodle page. With these remarks, let's, um, let's start right away. I will just repeat a, a very small portion of, of chapter 14, just that a few variables that are important um, are defined. So, um, here on my slides. Chapter 14, so we have the propagation of light pulses and we first define, so what we assume is that we are dealing with Gaussian pulses and the reason is simply that if you take the Fourier transform of a Gaussian pulse, it remains a Gaussian pulse and actually it turns out if you propagate such a pulse through media, then yeah, then uh, the envelope might become um, broader or narrower, but it will remain Gaussian. So this is um, why Gaussian pulses are particularly um, nice if one tries to do some analytic analysis. So um, we define a Gaussian pulse as you see here. So this is here the envelope and you see this A0 is well, is proportional, inversely proportional to the, to the width of this pulse. Uh, well, a square is also in between. Um, so the larger A0, you know, the smaller, the narrower the pulse. Um, and uh, one uh, other important thing here throughout this chapter is whenever you see an index, then it indicates that we mean at position Z equal to zero. So far, nothing new, but now um, I wrote here the phase that we, you usually would write as I omega t, if we just consider the temporal evolution. So usually you would uh, write here I omega t, but here we write, we write actually the next term in a power series expansion. So and we call this B naught t, um, uh, t square. Yeah? And, well, um, the first thing that, we, uh, that you could do is to look at a few uh, simple things, namely the widths of this pulse, and you could also define it in different, um, uh, in different ways, full with half maximum, uh, standard deviation, and so on and so forth. So just, um, um, just well, uh, trivial stuff. Uh, but the important point is, um, if you look at the phase and you take the derivative, then you get the instantaneous frequency. And now this instantaneous frequency is no longer constant. Uh, rather, it is time dependent as you see here. So we have a time dependent frequency, a frequency that changes in time. So may start at a lower frequency and go up to a higher frequency, we call this, uh, or if you try to, if you try to simulate this uh, in, uh, acoustically, then you would say 
Yeah, so lower tone first, higher tone later. You would say hui, um, and if it's the other way around, you would call it hiu. Um, this is what you see here, and uh, this is called a chirp parameter. Why it is called a chirp parameter? Well, birds chirp, and what they actually do is that they produce, well, on a much shorter time scale than I did, uh, they produce actually exactly these hiu and hui. And, um, well, birds uh, would consider actually our music as pretty boring because they think that, um, well, that, that uh, a sound with a chirp is much more interesting. Yeah? And the bird that can chirp nicest yeah, is a, a very attractive yeah, um, a partner for, uh, for other birds. birds. Okay, well, if we would plot it, then um, things would look like um, uh, would uh, look like this. Yeah, so here we have the time uh, axis, and you see that it oscillates faster and faster as time gets, uh, goes on. This would uh, be exactly such a, a hui um, tone, and um, well, it's positively chirped because this B not um, is. Is, uh, is larger than zero. What I do um, on the next, well, couple of pages in this chapter 14 is to derive on how um, these parameters, these parameters A and B, how they develop if you propagate in time. So um, then we don't have A naught and B naught, but A of, uh, A of Z and B of Z. And, um, well, the upshot is, uh, is this graph here. Uh, what it basically says is that if you start, say, with a chirp of zero, so that you have um, the same frequency all the time, then um, if you propagate through some, some medium, then the pulse gets longer. Yeah? So A naught uh, becomes smaller, and, uh, which means that the pulse gets longer. Right? And then the same, at the same time, um, or uh, simultaneously, the, um, the chip parameter, well, has this pe peculiar form, and some of you may recognize this as, yeah, as typical dispersion um, curves, um, well, what the relationship to regular di dispersion is, I would leave uh, open at this point. Then, the next point would be to derive a Schrodinger equation for this. Uh, you may know that this, um, that this differential equation that we call a Schrodinger equation, that this describes the dispersion of, um, well, of localized uh, functions. In quantum mechanics, it's typically a wave packet. Um, you can also derive a Schrodinger equation for optics uh, and describe diffraction in terms of this Schrodinger equation, at least in the paroxysmal uh, approximation. And here we describe the dispersion of pulses, of short pulses, as they propagate uh, through media. How do we do it? Well, uh, we start with the wave equation, with the famous wave equation, and you see that we have here the D field and the E field, and we transform this DE field into a E field at the expense that we have to include the refractive index. So um, what we do is that we, subs that we arrive here at um, the, the wave number, actually the wave number squared, and now we, um, we include here dispersion and actually also second order dispersion we could also include third order dispersion, but then things become, become ugly, uh, ugly and pulses no longer retain their Gaussian shape. Well, if we do all that, then we arrive at this equation, and this equation does not quite look like a Schrodinger equation, but it is a Schrodinger equation, at least if you make um, 
um, a transformation of the refer frame of reference. So if you include, uh, so if you um, substitute or if you change the variable t to a variable tau, um, that is the retarded time. So uh, tau is equal to t minus the um, uh, z over the um, over the group velocity. Okay. So this is the linear case, just as a very quick reminder of what um, this chapter 14 is about. And I assume that you had a look at it. And I think that is actually an interesting um, chapter beyond this course, because it describes the fundamentals of, or at least some fundamentals of ultra short or ultra fast optics. So now to the Schrodinger equation. I said that we in, uh, f for the derivation of the Schrodinger equation, we would take exactly the same steps as for the derivation of the, of the Schrodinger equation for the linear case. And um, here you see immediately the difference. I think we can start right away here. Yeah, so the, what we do now is that we include, of course, the nonlinear index of refraction. So we write it as here n plus uh, this delta n, and this delta n depends, of course, on the intensity. Um, well, and I introduce a few uh, variables here, so capital G and then capital G with a top bar and a, and a bottom bar. And uh, this is just in the same way as we de defined, um, well, other forms of the nonlinear refractive index, also with the top bar and with the bottom bar. And I think uh, it's repeated um, uh, here somewhere. Yeah? Um, but of course, uh, we also use here, we still use here this, um, this expansion. Um, but this um, quantity uh, we would substitute with the nonlinear. Um, yeah, so with this nonlinear addition. Well, uh, as I said, we take exactly the same step, and then we arrive at this equation that kind of looks like um, the Schrodinger equation. So there is still, well, uh, actually, this is this uh, this is already the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Yeah, so you see on the on the left hand side. Um, the first derivative um, here of the propagation uh, distance. And then here you see a second derivative. Um, well, uh, the spatial and the temporal coordinates, they are flipped as compared to quantum mechanics, but never mind. Yeah, so uh, this, doesn't, this doesn't hurt. Um, and here you have the potential term. Yeah, so in quantum mechanics, we would have the potential times the wave function. The wave function in our case is, uh, is, is, the, is the E field. And this thing here is the potential. Yeah, so in quantum mechanics, you would have V of x. And here you have something different. Yeah, so, but the remarkable thing is that you have the magnitude square of the wave function. And this makes it nonlinear. Yeah, so what you see is the bigger the amplitude gets, the greater the impact of this part here. OK, also here we introduce, um, we introduce this retarded time. And um, then we normalize the, uh, the amplitude to the amplitude at the posi position z equals to 0. And then, in addition, we define a few uh, other um, um, quantities, namely the dispersion length, which is given by the pulse duration squared divided by second order dispersion. Yeah, so just to give you an idea, uh, if you have a femtosecond pulse, then uh, this here would be, say, 20 femtoseconds squared. Yeah? And, um, and k double prime, what is this? Well, um, if you have the Selmayr coefficients of a piece of glass, then you can easily calculate this. And just to give you a number, 
for, um, for fused silica, quartz glass, um, they are at, yeah, so the second order dispersion, the K double prime uh, for uh, quartz glass, this is 36 femtoseconds squared per millimeter. Yeah, so femtoseconds squared per millimeter, um, also here we have femtoseconds squared, this, the femtoseconds squared cancel, and so you see that this thing here indeed has the dimension of lengths. So this is a length, actually, this quantity. And uh, now if you go back to um, chapter 14, then you would see that we have defined here a similar quantity, namely um, the dispersion lengths. Um, well, um, yeah, so we defined another type of dispersion lengths, Zd. And uh, this is similarly defined just with, um, yeah, so with A naught, which um, is proportional to one over um, sigma squared. Yeah, so this LD is equal to ZD divided by two, uh, just if you want to find a connection to the previous chapter. In addition to the dispersion lengths, we also define the nonlinear lengths, and um, this is given by um, one over yeah, so different definitions depending on which G you uh, prefer. So mostly we prefer probably this one here, All right? So G times I naught. And now if you look at uh, things, um, then you also see that this indeed has the dimension of a length because, um, because G times I is equal to omega naught divided by C and then n2 times i. n2 times i, this is what's added to the refractive index. So this has no um, dimension or dimension one. So uh, g times i will have the dimension of omega divided by c, and this of course has the dimension of a length. So indeed, ln also has the dimension of a length. And now if you do, um, if you put uh, things together, yeah, so this um, normalization and uh, here this uh, tau prime, um, then you, uh, you arrive at this equation. Yeah? Um, and the nice thing is, kind of nice thing here is that we now have the dispersion effect that we were dealing with in chapter 14, that we have this dispersion effect in this uh, term here, and the nonlinear effect only in the second term. Yeah? Well, of course, you could also infer this uh, from this differential equation already, but I think here it's, it's a little bit clearer. Now, let's look at this nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Yeah? So we will look at, um, at four characteristic cases, quite trivially. Yeah, so um, the first one would be that the length of the nonlinear medium through which you analyze the action of the, of the medium, that this is short as compared to the nonlinear length and also to the dispersion length. Yeah? And of course, this is the trivial case because this means that neither nonlinear effect nor dispersion effects as discussed in chapter 14 play a role and what we expect is that a pulse that, a, that the pulse uh, won't um, won't change right so uh, here it's written up yeah neither dispersion nor nonlinear effects play a role um, a distance is comparable uh, comparable comparable to the length of the medium l yeah consequently um, you can neglect all these terms on the right hand side of the uh, differential equation. And this means, um, well, that um, the field as a function of z doesn't change, right? Um, trivial. But we can actually look at an example what it means actually if we want to, if we want to satisfy this condition, optical communication in a fiber. Yeah? So you 
um, assume that we have that we want to do telecommunications, have a glass fiber, 50 kilometers of lengths, yeah? glass fiber of fused silica, say. Um, and in order to satisfy this condition, we say that the dispersion lengths and the nonlinear lengths both should be 500 kilometers long. Is this possible? So now, if we have an optical fiber and we take the telecommunication wavelengths of uh, 1.55 uh, micrometers and then at this uh, telecommunication length the dispersion, second order dispersion would be minus 20 femtoseconds squared per millimeter. So you see, we want to keep this dispersion length positive Therefore, yeah, by definition, the dispersion length is supposed to be positive. And in order to allow, nevertheless, this first term to change its sign, um, there's this signum function, which returns minus one if k double prime is smaller than one, and plus one if k double prime is, is positive. Yeah? So, and here it is actually indeed negative. Um, and then we um, say, well, LD should be larger, should be 500 kilometers. And with this, we get a pulse length, um, a maximum, no, uh, a maximum pulse length. Yeah? So if the pulse length is shorter, then the pulses disperse um, quicker. Yeah? So they, they disperse uh, more easily. So the pulse length shouldn't be larger than 100 picoseconds. But 100 picoseconds is, well, is a, is, is a, is a, is a decent, um, yeah, so this is 10 gigahertz, corresponds to 10 gigahertz. This is a decent um, yeah, inverse frequency. Now we can look what this means for the intensity, for the maximum intensity. Well. Um, we estimate N2 with 10 to the minus 16 centimeters squared per watt. Um, we use a cross-section of the fiber of 10 square micrometer, perhaps a little bit large, right? And then we can calculate um, G, um, in this case under bar, and we would arrive at four per kilometer and watt. Yeah? And then we can estimate the power and we find that we shouldn't exceed a power of half a milliwatt. Yeah? And I wrote here perfectly reasonable, but uh, think a little bit. Um, half a milliwatt, um, you have to consider also that it's 100 picoseconds long. Right? So this will be quite a small pulse energy. And uh, this, of course, also implies, well, which is, of course, good. Um, not bad, yeah, that you have a small pulse energy. But on the other hand, uh, there will be always losses in such a fiber. And um, yeah, at some point, uh, noise could be a problem. Yeah, but um, yeah, certainly OK. OK, the next case would be that, um, that the length is large. The length of the medium, the length of the fiber is large as compared to the dispersion length. Then, of course, dispersion plays a role, but still uh, nonlinear effects don't play a role. Um, so what we would get um, for our Schrodinger equation would be that we neglect the last part, and we're pretty much left with what we had in chapter 14. But actually, also here, we can think of a little example. Yeah, so we just take the previous example. Uh, yeah, so we look at it from the other side. So if we use um, uh, here a pulse duration of one picoseconds instead of the 100 picoseconds, yeah, um, then, of course, the dispersion length is 100 squared times 10,000 times shorter. And this would be. 50 meters. Yeah? And this would actually imply that we would have to reduce the energy by a factor of 100 in order to keep the power below um, 0 0.5 milliwatts. Yeah? If we want to keep the nonlinear lengths 
much larger than the length of the fiber such that nonlinear effects can be neglected. So you see that this nonlinear and dispersion lengths, that they are convenient measures um, for estimating whether dispersion effects or nonlinear effects are important for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Well, and then the other cases, and these cases actually will be uh, those that we will look at uh, in this lecture in particular, um, namely that uh, we can neglect dispersion, um, but that we can't ne neglect nonlinear effects. And of course, um, finally, there the would uh, be the case where both are important, and this will be the topic of the next lecture, of the last ne uh, lecture in this course. And um, yeah, so the interplay of dispersion and nonlinear effects, they result in particularly intriguing effects, solitons, um, and well, as I said, this will be the topic of next, um, of the next lecture, of the last lecture. Good, well. So, um, we did it, yeah? So I didn't write all these things uh, uh, up, yeah? So we can immediately go to the case that I just discussed, namely that nonlinear effects are important and the uh, interspersion effects are uh, not important. Solution of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation for negligible dispersion. So, um, yeah, let's just start to write, uh, to take a few notes here. So, um, for negligible dispersion, Um, the first term on uh, the right hand side of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, NLS of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, can be neglected. Yep. And we are then left with the following equation. So we have I times the derivative of U with respect to zeta is 1 over the nonlinear lengths. And then we have this nonlinear term, namely the magnitude squared of U times well, what you could call the wave function. So that's supposed to be equation 20. Yeah. Differential equation, and the question is, what is a solution? And to find a solution is easiest if you, if you know the solution, right? So uh, we, uh, find the solution with an ansatz, with an educated guess. Um, so we make the following ansatz. So u of zeta and tau prime, this is u naught, yeah? so zeta equal to zero. Um, and then we have an exponential here, an exponential function, and imagina uh, an imaginary uh, exponential function. Which is important. I will comment on that um, in a few minutes. And <clears throat> What you would do with this ansatz is, of course, to substitute it into the, into the Schrodinger equation, and you'll find that it's actually 
yeah, that this ansatz satisfies um, this, um, well, this reduced Schrodinger equation. Um, yeah, um, let's discuss this, um, this ansatz here a little bit. I emphasized here that this exponential is, yeah, so that this exponential uh, is imaginary. Yeah, so it's just a phase term. So what it means is that the amplitude, the magnitude of u is not changed. In other words, um, if we can neglect the dispersion lengths, if we can neglect dispersion effects, then the pulse, uh, the envelope of the pulse will remain the same. Yeah? So let's write that up. So a remark. Um, the ansatz implies that um, the amplitudes u of zeta and tau prime or of course then also e of z and t don't change. Yeah. They are independent of Z. Yeah. If you send this pulse through a fiber where dispersion can be neglected, where the dispersion length is very long, then the pulse to ratio will not change. Yeah, in stark contrast to the case that we have um, if dispersion dominates. Yeah, and of course, if E, if the magnitude of E doesn't change, then also the uh, intensity is independent of, of Z. Yeah, so um, also E of Z T is independent of Z. Yeah, so the pulse duration does not change. Um, during propagation. Now you could say, how boring if nothing changes. Well, something does change. Yeah? And in order to find that out, we will define the nonlinear phase shift phi, capital phi. So um, define the nonlinear phase shift capital Phi, and because it's non, uh, in order to make this clear um, that it's due to the nonlinearity, um, we give it this, this index N. Uh, and what it basically is, is, uh, so this is cap basically, uh, actually this here is basically um, this nonlinear phase shift. So phi n is defined as minus zeta over ln times this normalized um, this normalized amplitude. Yeah, and I wrote here zero because uh, it doesn't change anyway. Yeah, so this uh, term u doesn't change. 
Of course, the nonlinear phase, uh, this changes upon propagation because we have here the propagation, um, the propagation variable. So that's equation 22. And um, now we can write, of course, uh, this equation 20, no, 21, a little bit in a little bit simpler form you know, or more compact form. So u of zeta tau prime, this is equal to u of zero tau prime times the exponential of i times phi n, which depends on zeta and tau prime. Yeah, equation 23. Okay, well, if you um, would, if you prefer, instead of the normalized amplitude, the regular one, um, then I can also uh, write this down. Yeah, so in terms of the non-normalized amplitude. There we would have E of Z and T is equal to E at zero position and T. And then we have the exponential minus I Z over the nonlinear lengths um, times the magnitude square of E divided by E naught. Uh, also, there's a misprint still in the script here. Just realize. Oh yeah, by the way, because I just found a mistake in the script, um, there's a new version of the script on Moodle. And another point that I also wrote in my email uh, yesterday, if you find mistakes in the script, please let me know such that it improves over the years. Good. Um, then uh, for the nonlinear lengths, uh, we can write down different versions, of course, uh, depending on whether we prefer the normalized um, version or the non normalized version. And we have different expressions for the nonlinear refractive index and so on and so forth. Yeah. So different. versions for phi n. So we have phi n of z and t equal to z divided by ln times e0 times t divided by e0 squared or minus z over ln and then I take it, um, yeah, the field including all its quick oscillations, which of course gives the same thing. Or I could also write minus, I could write it with the intensity. Right? Then I would have the intensity at position zero divided. Um, As a, uh, yeah, intensity at position zero is a function of time divided by the maximum, by the peak intensity. So this is equation 25. Yeah, not very important, of course. Um, but now um, it gets interesting. Now we start to, to look um, on, well, um, I explained already 
that the derivative of the phase is the instantaneous frequency. And so you see that here we have a peculiar phase evolution. Um, so we uh, want to write this, um, yeah, this nonlinear phase um, as a function of, um, well, or in terms of the nonlinear refractive index. So, um, using the nonlinear lengths defined as 1 over g times the intensity at position z equal to 0, um, we can write phi n of z and t equals to z of g of i at zero and t, and um, then we can write uh, minus z times omega naught divided by c times n2 times i naught and t, um, where this here is, of course, equal to del n, you know, to the nonlinear part of the refractive index. And, um, well, um, this we then can write as minus z times delta k, right? So, where delta k is the nonlinear part of the, of the wave number. Okay, so here we have the intensity now in very general terms. And the idea is now to use a Gaussian pulse. Yeah, so instead of I um, of zero and T, I write a Gaussian pulse. So for a Gaussian pulse, Um, we find that phi n is equal to minus z over the nonlinear lengths times the exponential of minus 2 times a naught times t squared. Yeah. And, well, um, we can quickly look at this uh, with, a, with a little figure. Yeah. So you see here the pulse, the Gaussian pulse, right? And the nonlinear lengths, uh, the nonlinear phase develops in just the same way, just with the opposite sign. And now you can use this in order to find another definition for the nonlinear lengths. Yeah, um, perhaps we do this quickly and then um, make a short, make a short break. Um, yeah. Um, So from 27, we see immediately that we reach a minimum for this phase, well, exactly at this point. Yeah? And this is trivial to calculate. Yeah? So we see immediately that phi n minimum is equal to minus z divided by ln. And this we can use in order to, yeah, to define the nonlinear lengths a little bit different. The nonlinear lengths 
is that propagation distance where the phase has changed due to nonlinear effects by one radian. Yeah? So, um, when the pulse has propagated a distance um, z equals the nonlinear length, then um, the nonlinear phase phi n will have changed um, by one radian. Yeah, with this Let's have a short break. And we would reconvene in five minutes. I hope you have time to prepare a quick coffee.
So, I guess we should continue. I hope everybody can hear me. Well, um, now let's look on what self-face modulation um, can do. Um, yeah, so we have this nonlinear length that is changed by, uh, no, the nonlinear phase that is changed by the, that by the pulse itself. Yeah, so this is the upshot of what you see here. Um, yeah, so we have this nonlinear length that is changed, uh, this nonlinear phase, sorry, uh, that is changed by, by the pulse itself. So it modifies its own phase, and this is called self-phase modulation. And in the next chapter, we will, uh, or sub-chapter, we will look on what this is doing. Self-phase modulation, 15.4. So we consider a pulse that has no initial chirp. Yeah, so at the entrance phase of um, the material that we are considering, say a glass fiber that where the pulse intensity is so high that the nonlinear refractive index plays a role. Um, so this um, optical fiber, uh, in this optical fiber, we launch a pulse that has no chirp initially, so that the frequency is constant as a function of time. And now let's see what happens with this pulse. We know already one thing, namely that the pulse duration will not change if um, yeah, the precondition that we are dealing with, namely that the length is shorter than the dispersion length is fulfilled. So um, let's write that up. Um, we consider a pulse without chirp at z equals to zero, yeah, so which means that b naught is equal to zero. Um, now, in the linear case, we know how the phase develops. Yeah? So uh, this is this usual argument of a wave, namely omega t minus k times z. Yeah? So in the linear case, which we will generalize to the nonlinear case, of course, in the linear case, we have phi is equal to omega naught times t minus k times k naught times z, yeah, where um, in this case, the index of k naught refers actually um, to the frequency omega naught, where um, k naught is equal to omega naught divided by c times n. So in this, we generalize And then we have the total phase, which is omega naught times t minus k in, in vacuum times the total refractive index times z. And um, of course, now you can write this as um, n plus delta n times z. And um, yeah, and then you can use the nonlinear phase that we introduced. So we have k vacuum n times z plus the nonlinear phase. And uh, we could also write. Um, we could also introduce an, um, a nonlinear optical pass length. Yeah, or the pass lengths in general first. Yeah, so minus k vacuum times the total optical pass lengths. 
And for the optical pass links, we can write the regular one, yeah, so the linear one plus the nonlinear one. And this is n times z plus delta n times z. Yeah, so just to, um, to introduce a few quantities. Good. Now, if you look at uh, things, then um, it is clear that this, um, that this phase here is time dependent. Um, and well, if we take the derivative of this phase, then we find the instantaneous frequency. So this equation 30 implies a time dependent frequency. And this omega of z and t, this is given by the derivative of this total phase. And uh, what you get is, of course, omega naught plus the derivative of the nonlinear phase that we introduced. Yeah. And now, again, you can write different expressions for that. Um, one would be omega naught minus z times g. And now the derivative of the intensity Yeah, the time dependence is only in the intensity. So we find that the time dependent frequency depends on the derivative of the intensity. We take, again, the special case of a Gaussian pulse in order to get an idea of what, is, of what will go on. So we look at 32 for a Gaussian pulse. And what we use is I of z and t equals, well, it actually doesn't depend here on z. Um, so I of t, oh, I could have written z and t, of course. Yeah, so uh, the pulse shape remains the same as we emphasized several times. So this is the usual form that we use for a Gaussian pulse. Now, um, if you do this, then you find that omega of z and t is given by omega naught plus z times g times, and then I have to calculate the derivative. So what I find is 4a naught times t times i naught times the same exponential. Yeah? So 4 because I have 2 here, and if I take the derivative of t squared, I get another factor of 2. So that's equation 33. Well, um, what we, we want to make the connection actually to the linear case. So to chapter 14. Remember in chapter 14, we had for the instantaneous frequency just the constant term that we also have here. And then we had a linear term, namely B naught times T. And uh, here, well, we, we have something nonlinear. It's actually even a Gaussian function exponential function here. And so it's natural that as a next step, we would just use a power series expansion of that term. Yeah? So the next point would be 
a Taylor series expansion. Taylor expansion. Now, so we want to write this omega t um, as omega at uh, t equal to zero plus the derivative taken at was also at t equal to zero times t plus then the next term t squared. Yeah? And well, this is trivial to do. Yeah? So you would calculate the first and the second derivative of 33, of equation 33, and then you find that omega of z and t is approximately omega naught plus z times uh, divided by the nonlinear length times 4a naught times t. That's the linear part. And now the nonlinear part, uh, the, um, the second order term. So this is one half z over ln times 4a naught times 4a naught times t squared. And um, this is equal to omega naught plus z over ln times 4a naught times t. And then we have 1 plus, no, 1 minus minus 2a naught times t. Once again, the idea was to connect this chapter to chapter 14, where we found for um, for the phase, so where we used for the phase a naught, no, uh, we used uh, omega naught times t plus b naught times t squared. Um, and now we try to yeah, relate this equation 34 um, to, the, to what we had in chapter 14. So in order to find an interpretation, an interpretation, now so what this will do physically, in order to find an interpretation for equation 34, we compare Um, to yeah, the expression um, omega t equals to omega naught times t plus b times t squared or omega t equals 2 times b times t. Um, or established, let's say, established in chapter 14. Yeah? So what we, what we demand is that two, 2b times t squared, no, t, just, that this is the same well, it won't be the same because uh, this is just linear and the other is, uh, is quadratic. But nevertheless, in first order, they should be the same. So we have 4 times a naught times t, 1 plus 2 times a naught times t. Right? And if we drop the quadratic te uh, term, um, then we get... Dropping the quadratic ta uh, term, then we get the b, but now as a function of z, 
yeah, because the right hand side depends on z, that this is equal to 2 times a naught times z divided by the nonlinear lengths. Yeah, so what we see here is now a very interesting um, thing, namely that the dispersion parameter b increases linearly as you propagate through, say, the glass fiber. In other words, the chirp will get larger and larger and larger. Yeah, so this hui, this will get steeper and steeper and steeper. Well, again, we can write this equation in different, um, in different versions. Yeah, so if we use ln, if we use this definition as 1 over g times i0, um, then 35 can be written as b of z equals 2 times a0 times g times i0 times times z. Um, and this is equal to 2 times a0 times z times 2 pi over lambda n2 times i0. Uh, and what I used uh, was the definition of g. Uh, so uh, g, by definition, is omega naught divided by c times n2. Equation 36. Yeah? And now, as a final point here, we write down what it does, namely uh, what I explained already, the chirp parameter grows linearly with propagation distances. Yeah? And what this means is that new frequencies are generated all the time during this propagation. Yeah? So the chirp parameter grows linearly with propagation distance set um, and this means new frequencies or new frequency components um, are, are added to the pulses spectrum um, throughout the propagation. So I hope that you understand this uh, conclusion. Um, yeah, so um, if you if you really studied uh, chapter fourteen, then you know that um, we that we have a band with limited pulse. So the shortest possible pulse for a given spectrum, if the chirp parameter is equal to zero, and now. We have the situation that the pulse length does not change, but the chirp parameter increases during propagation. So this means that you, at the end of the propagation, you don't have um, uh, you don't have an, um, um, a band with limited pulse because the chirp parameter is no longer zero. Right, and this means that the bandwidth must have gotten larger. So there was a comment here. 
your microphone is not good enough. Okay, good. So this is the essential point. We have spectral broadening due to sulfase modulation. And now we want to calculate how large this spectral broadening is, in fact. So that's the next chapter, and actually more or less the final chapter or sub-chapter for today, namely chapter 15.5. Spectral broadening due to phase, cell phase modulation. We want to calculate how much the band with how much the full with half maximum of the spectrum increases due to propagation through the medium. So 15.5 spectral broadening. Um, due to cell phase modulation. Well, maybe I start here with a particular, in my opinion, with a particular impressive um, yeah, incarnation of, uh, of this effect. So what we frequently do in order to produce a shorter pulse, a shorter pulse then our lasers can deliver, what we do is that we feed the pulses that we have into a hollow fiber. Um, so the following thing. Yeah, so assume that we have here a hollow core fiber, something like, like this here, uh, not nice. And this fiber, a glass capillary, perhaps a meter long, a fraction of a, of a millimeter thick, 200 micrometers or so, and then you would feed a pulse into this fiber, say of a length, as is typical in my lab, for example, of 20 femtoseconds. Um, then according to what we, what we just learned, it will come out with 20 femtoseconds pulse duration. Well, in our case, there's probably a little bit dispersion, but it will come out with uh, 20 femtoseconds uh, pulse duration, but it will be, it will be strongly chirped. Yeah? Perhaps something like that. And then you can, yeah, so, uh, which implies that also its spectral bandwidth is larger. And actually, this is a very beautiful experiment um, and also quite impressive. Yeah, so once this crisis, this corona crisis, um, um, yeah, softens a little bit, um, I would like to invite you to my lab where you can see this live. Um, we typically use femtosecond laser pulses with a wavelength of 800 nanometers here. So they are barely visible. But they get spectrally broadened in this fiber tremendously, such that you get more or less white light out here. That's a very beautiful experiment, actually. And very useful because uh, if this pulse then is recompressed, it can be as short as four femtoseconds or even less. And uh, this, is, this is very important because an optical cycle at 800 nanometers is already two and a half cycles long. So if you have a pulse that is shorter than, than um, five femtoseconds, then it has less than two optical cycles. Yeah, so quite remarkable kinds of, of pulses that have all kinds of new properties which are actually at the center of my own research interests. Yeah, this is why I like this effect so much. Okay, um, so let's first set up the, um, yeah, let's first set up an idea on how to quantify the spectral broadening. 
So what we have to do in order to define the spectral bandwidth is of course to find the deviation of the frequency from the sender frequency. So, and this we write down here in order to calculate um, the bandwidth um, at a certain position Z, we have to calculate the deviation um, delta omega um, from the sender frequency. omega naught. Yeah? So something like delta omega is equal to omega minus omega naught. And now if we use the equation 33, yeah? so this equation up here, then we can do this immediately. Um, what we find is that delta omega is equal to z divided by ln 4a0 times t times the exponential of minus 2a0 times t squared. And what you always already see is um, a very important thing, namely that this deviation which defines or determines the spectral broadening, that this depends yeah, linearly here with A0. And you know, um, A0 is inversely proportional to the square of, uh, no, uh, A not squared, it's inverse, uh, inversely proportional to the pulse duration. In other words, the shorter the pulse is, the bigger the effect. Yes, you would have guessed that, I guess, yeah, because it depends, of course, on the derivative of the, um, of the intensity. Yes, and if you make the pulse shorter, then, of course, the derivatives get larger. Um, now, in order to really calculate delta omega, um, yeah, so, or the spectral bandwidth, we have to calculate the maximum deviation from the, central uh, from the center frequency. So we have to find the maximum of this here. Yeah? So the instant the instant Tm during the pulse um, at which um, delta omega is maximum determines the band with Um, of the pulse after propagation through the medium. So we find the maximum. Yeah? So quite easy and straightforward. We look for the maximum and this means that we uh, look where the Der derivative is equal to, to zero, right? And what we find after a quick calculation is that this is the case if, two, uh, if four times a naught times t squared equals one. And this means that this tm is given by plus minus 
1 over the square root of 4a0. And now if you look it up in equation uh, in chapter 14, then you find that this is the time yeah, where equal to the standard uh, deviation. Right? It's not the full width half maximum. It's slightly off. Yeah? So now we plug this in in order to calculate the bandwidth. Yeah. So, but uh, first we write this up. So at t equals to sigma t zero, we generate um, the frequency that has the largest deviation. from omega naught. Yeah. Um, this is no surprise because the slope of i is largest there. Um, this is no surprise because um, the slope of I, the intensity as a function of time, is largest at these times. Yes, the falling and the rising edge of the pulse. So now we substitute this into equation 40. Yeah, well, this is this equation here. Yeah, and then we find the delta omega. So substitute um, Tm equals sigma T0 into equation 40. And then we get the maximum deviation. And we have Z over Ln times 4 times a0 times 1 over the square root of 4a0 times the exponential of minus 2 times a0 divided by 4 times a0. And um, this is, of course, equal to 1 over the square root of the Euler number. And this gives z over ln times the square root of 4a0 divided by e, the Euler number. Yeah, and uh, what you see here is that we have the maximum um, bandwidth now as a function well, of the initial pulse duration. But of course, we could also transform this pulse duration into the, uh, into the initial spectrum. We assumed, just as a reminder, we assumed that we start as a bandwidth limited pulse. So we can easily transform this into uh, the respective spectrum. So if we use um, so using um, that the minimum phase nonlinear phase is given by Z over Ln and that the spectral width the standard deviation of the spectrum is given by a naught times one plus b naught squared divided by a naught squared. Um, and we use this um, we use this for b equals zero. 
So this means for P not equal to zero, we have sigma omega is equal to um, have no square, no, probably the square root of A naught. Yeah. Then we find for the maximum, um, so for the spectral width, we find minus phi n minimum, uh, which basically carries the nonlinear coefficients, uh, so how large the nonlinear length is, and two times the square root of the Euler number and the spectral width, the initial spectral width. Yeah? A broad initial spectral width means or implies, for a bandwidth limited situation, implies a short pulse and therefore a strong effect. Yeah? So this is what you find. Um, yeah? So this is what this equation says. Well, and of course, uh, this thing here depends on the, um, yeah, so this nonlinear fa um, phase here, this minimum nonlinear phase depends on the input power. Okay, um, a final thing here, namely, we can try to find um, whether this pulse that we produce, whether this has an up chirp or whether it has a down chirp, whether it makes hui or whether it makes hiu. Um, actually, in, if you look at the linear case, then in the region of normal dispersion, so glasses in the visible range, they typically have a K double prime that is positive. Yeah, so if you propagate in the linear case a pulse through some glass or so, right, then at least in the visible range, the pulse um, will have an up chirp. Um, so hui. Um, we have seen another example already where we looked at um, propagation through, through a fiber at a wavelength in the near infrared at a wavelength of 1.5 micrometers. They are actually, they are glasses that have the opposite uh, K double prime. Um, and here now we want to look which kind of chirp will uh, be produced by, um, by this nonlinear effect in contrast to the linear effects that were discussed in chapter 15, uh, 14. Um, yeah, so in order to find, um, in order to find the sign of B of Z, um, we have a closer look Um, at equation 18, and I repeat it here, delta omega is equal to Z over LN for A naught times T, and then the exponential of minus two times A naught times T squared. Yeah? Uh, what we know is that Z A naught and LN are positive. Yeah, so the nonlinear refractive index is um, is yeah as a rule positive, in almost all, all cases positive, um, and therefore for t smaller than zero, uh, this is the leading edge of the pulse. 
there we have the delta omega is smaller than zero, right? So the frequency is lower. Well, and then I don't need to continue for uh, t larger than zero, it's the opposite. So indeed, in the leading edge of the pulse, the frequency is lower, and then it gets higher, so this pulse makes a hui, and this means a positive chirp. Now, um, what you might have guessed is that um, things are actually, um, yeah, so this, this is only a, a pretty rough look what we have. Yeah? So we produce colors all the time, right? And I took the extreme colors in order to define the bandwidth. And you might have um, wondered why, um, yeah, why we don't take why we don't take into account of how much a color is is uh, is produced, right? So um, what you would guess is actually that the spectral shape um, changes in this case due to cell phase modulation, and um, this is indeed the case. Uh, plus the situation that we. Um, that we produce throughout the pulse new frequencies, and these frequencies can, of course, interfere with the frequencies that are already there. Um, and, well, these spectra indeed look quite, um, look quite complicated, and I have here a final figure, um, and it depends very much on how you, on how you run such an experiment. If you really do what we did here, namely that we start with zero initial chirp, then you would get um, a spectrum. Yeah, so if it's only self-phase modulation, it would look like that. Right? Um, if you start with a positive chirp, yeah, so remember um, self-phase modulation produces a positive chirp, and now if you start already with a positive chirp, then it really looks ugly. If you do it the other way around, that you start with a negative chirp such that what you produce yeah, partly compensates of what you're doing, then you get this situation. Okay, um, this is all what I wanted to um, explain today. I hope you found it uh, interesting and next time the last lecture will be on solitons. Um, it's um, yeah, it's it's a fairly it's a fairly uh, yeah mathematical. Uh, there would be a lot of things to write, so I will present it as a PowerPoint presentation. Um, and I hope you will join. See you next Monday. And if you wish tonight well, this evening, later this afternoon, at five o'clock on a Zoom meeting. If you have questions, comments, or something, uh, then we can discuss it at, at five. Thank you.